top of land, and then the Earth starts to warm. So widespread melting of those ice sheets uh, begins, and the glaciers uh, recede, leaving in their wake environments that used to be completely buried under ice, but are now exposed. And if you go into areas like, for example, around British Columbia, you'll find that the islands around Vancouver are dotted with freshwater post-glacial lakes covered uh, in these formerly ice-covered regions. Those freshwater lakes, if you uh, look in them, very frequently have sticklebacks that have come in uh, from the ocean but then adapted to the local environmental conditions in the lake. That adaptation includes uh, decisions about uh, how to avoid predators. This shows a trout trying to eat a stickleback. You can see the sticklebacks sometimes uh, get away, so the armor that they have can be very useful. Sticklebacks are also uh, eaten by insects. And the preying strategy of an insect is actually to reach out and grab onto things like spines of sticklebacks, uh, reel them in, and then uh, munch them uh, from the sides. So depending on the kinds of predators that you're uh, uh, encountering in different lakes, it may be better or worse uh, to have or to lose uh, armor. So that's just one example of the kinds of environmental factors set off by this widespread change in climate, but then an adaptive radiation as an ancestral marine form uh, colonizes and evolves to the ecological conditions in different lakes. So the ancestral marine fish uh, is shown here. They're not usually this red. Uh, this fish has actually been stained with a dye called a lizard red, which uh, highlights all of the skeletal structures. The marine fish, completely covered with armor plates from head to tail. It has the three prominent spines that Alex Trebek mentioned. You can also see a spine down here on the belly region that we'll come back to. That ancestral form has radiated in different freshwater lakes and streams throughout the northern hemisphere, Europe and uh, North America and Asia. When naturalists first came through the lakes of the northern hemisphere, they found what they classified as over 40 different species of sticklebacks because they look so different from each other. So in these freshwater lakes, the three-spine stickleback kind of turn into a two-spine, a one-spine, or a no-spine stickleback. The teeth and the jaws are extensively modified as the fish adapt to different food sources that are available in particular environments. The armor patterns change a lot. You can be heavily armored and slow or lightly armored and fast. The hind limb of the fish comes and goes. Colors, uh, a variety of physiological traits, salinity tolerance, temperature preference, it all depends on what environmental challenges uh, the fish have been trying uh, to reach. All of this has happened in just the last 10,000 years or so since these environments got created. And in fact, although many of the fish are reproductively isolated in the wild, the isolating mechanisms turn out to usually be either behavioral or mechanical incompatibilities. So you can overcome those by squeezing out uh, eggs and sperm uh, from the fish, and you uh, can raise perfectly fertile F1 hybrids that can then be used for exactly the sort of genetic experiment that we've gone through before for Tiacente and corn to try to track down the genetic basis now of evolutionary change in natural populations subject to a full range of fitness constraints uh, in the wild. All kinds of interesting uh, traits that are uh, analyzable by this sort of approach, and that's because of the incredible diversity of different traits that have evolved uh, in wild sticklebacks. There's actually huge literature on sticklebacks, a couple of thousand papers and several full-length textbooks uh, that have been uh, written on the distribution and the ecology and the morphology and the behavior of different fish forms around the world. So uh, it's possible to take almost any trait that you're interested in and find interesting stickleback populations. We and many other stickleback labs uh, send out uh, students and postdocs from the lab each year to go collect from uh, interesting sites where fish have evolved. This is a graduate student lab uh, shown collecting sticklebacks in the Northwest Territories. The fish are relatively uh, easy to catch. You throw in these minnow buckets that have conical openings at the end. The fish get funneled in uh, to the trap, and then the hole is small enough that, or they're not smart enough to swim back out the other side. So if you trap a whole bunch of lakes and streams, you can just come back the next day, and their traps uh, typically are uh, got lots of sticklebacks in them. The fish are small and uh, relatively easy to move around and uh, work with in different uh, aquatic environments. You can see here buckets of fish that have uh, been brought back to a hotel room uh, in the Northwest Territories. It's actually possible to set up uh, fertilizations and crosses under the microscope uh, right there in the hotel rooms and bring back fertilized egg clutches. We also bring back live fish. We're also collaborating with uh, lots of 
uh, stickleback investigators that are interested in particular populations and have studied them for years, including uh, a long-standing collaboration with Dolph Schluter, thousands of sticklebacks every year uh, for ecological studies. Okay, so we've got all sorts of different traits that are uh, segregating in these wild populations. I want to talk about the genetic basis of some of the differences, and we'll start um, by talking about the lateral plates. This is one of the major morphological differences that's evolved repeatedly in uh, different, different uh, locations. This uh, image is actually taken from an old uh, monograph by uh, the famous French naturalist Cuvier, who several decades before the origin of species gave different species names to marine and freshwater forms of sticklebacks because of the dramatic changes uh, in bony patterns. The marine form is shown on the top with plates from head to tail. Freshwater form is shown on the bottom. Many of the freshwater forms have lost a lot of the armor plates, uh, retaining them only at the front or having very few plates at all. Again, this is thought to be uh, almost a military decision about the best kind of armor to have in particular environments. You can either be heavily armored and slow or lightly armored and fast. So there's a higher burst swimming speed in the low-plated sticklebacks. Depending on the predators that are chasing you, it may be better to have one form or the other. Okay, now, we can do for sticklebacks exactly the sort of genetic archaeology experiment that we described before for maize and tiacente. So take a marine form and a freshwater form that look very different in the number of plates, 35 or 36 plates in the marine fish shown on the left, only a single plate left uh, in one of these freshwater populations from uh, Paxton Lake near Vancouver. Generate an F1 hybrid generation, intercross the F1s to generate the F2 grandchildren that are uh, putting back together in various chromosome combinations all of the marine and the freshwater chromosomes, then go in, count armor plate numbers in all of those uh, F2 offspring, isolate DNA samples, type them with a set of genetic markers that we've developed for genome-wide linkage mapping in sticklebacks, and then look to see whether there's particular chromosomes that always go together uh, with particular traits. When you do that, what we found was that there's a single major gene on the distal end of uh, linkage group four that controls about 70% of the variation in armor plate number uh, in the cross. So a very large genetic effect. It's not as simple as a Mendelian trait. There's also uh, chromosomes that have smaller quantitative effects on plate number. So we call these modifier genes, quantitative modifiers. They may each control somewhere between 5 and 10% of the variation in armor plate number uh, in the cross. Okay, so in many ways, these results are very similar to what I described before uh, for doing this kind of experiment in maize or tiacente. As in maize and tiacente, it's also possible once you've identified one of these chromosome regions to go into that region, sequence all of the DNA in that area, and decode uh, the actual genes that are in that region that may be controlling uh, the traits. We've been able to do that for this major gene region that controls armor plate number in sticklebacks and been able to identify a single signaling molecule gene that plays a key role in armor plate formation. The easiest way to demonstrate that it plays a key role is to reintroduce that gene into uh, eggs from low armored fish. So you can uh, directly inject fertilized eggs from low armored fish uh, with the gene from the chromosome region that controls armor. And when you do that, you put armor plates back on the sides of the stickleback. Again, very like the kinds of single gene experiments that have been done uh, for corn and diacente. And the conclusions are very similar. Single genes can control uh, major morphological differences now in these populations that have evolved in natural environments. Okay, there's actually um, talk about uh, one other trait, which is the presence or the absence of the hind fin. Fish are like most land animals. They have four major uh, fins, uh, appendages or limbs. Two uh, forefins or pectoral fin 